Hey folks, this is Scott Weingart from the MCRIT Podcast. And today we're going to start the MCRIT Podcast Lecture Series. And there's no better topic to start with than mastering the ventilator. Now this talk has been up on the now defunct MCRIT Lecture site for a while, but the audio quality was horrible. So I figured I'd update it, re-record it, split it up into two parts so it's nice and digestible, and hopefully you'll like it. All right, let me tell you a little story about the best ventilator talk ever. And just so you know, this is not the best ventilator talk ever. This is something very different. I don't know about you, but when I was a resident getting vent talks, I always left very confused and not happy with the knowledge I had gained. So I figured I'd go to fellowship at Shock Trauma and I would pick up everything I could about ventilators. I would pick people's brains. That convict looking guy on the left, that's Nader Habashi, one of the smartest guys on vents I've ever met. And I just uh, racked him with questions during my fellowship. I read everything I could get my hands on. And I came back and I gave the best ventilator talk ever to my residents. It had computations, it had formulae, it had esoteric modes of ventilation that most ED physicians would never see in the course of their career. Problem is I left my residents confused and bewildered. So after that I figured, all right, there's gotta be a better way. There's gotta be a way to have an easily manageable solution to ventilators in the ED. And that's when I came up with not the best ventilator talk ever. And that's what this is. All right, so this is spinning dials, how to dominate the ventilator. So you know who I am by now. And you know what I'm about. I'm about upstairs care, downstairs, emergency department, critical care. Geography should not determine the patient's care. They should get the exact same care when they hit the door as they get when they go upstairs to the ICU. Still have no conflicts of interest to report. All right, this is essentially a lecture in two parts. There's lung injury. There's a strategy for managing patients with lung injury. And there's a strategy for managing patients with obstructive lung disease, like asthma or COPD. And essentially, if the patient doesn't have asthma or COPD, they're not an obstructive patient, then they're lung injury. And that's your only two choices. That's it. Only two strategies for managing the vent in the ED, lung injury or obstruction. So in part one, we're going to deal with lung injury. And then in part two, we'll talk about the obstructive strategy. And you're saying to yourself, well, what about the patients that don't have obstruction and the patients that don't have lung injury? What about them? Well, I'll tell you, you just treat them like lung injury patients. And I'll tell you why. First of all, uh, the strategy I'm going to show you is applicable to any patient. But I didn't have good evidence to support that. And now finally I do. This is a randomized controlled trial. Um, they put patients on what we would consider normal tidal volumes for non-lung injury patients, which is 10 cc's per kg versus low tidal volume strategy, which is what I'm going to tell you about. And those patients' lungs did not do well on the conventional ventilation, even though they had no lung injury. They had nothing wrong with their lungs. They were just fine. So any patient, when not managed with lung protective ventilation, which is what I'm going to teach you about, does worse. All right, you got to know about the ARDSnet. They are a huge study group that tries to find mortality benefit in critical care interventions, primarily those focused on ventilator management and hemodynamics. And the ARDSNET group came up with a strategy that actually showed mortality reduction for ventilator management. And to my knowledge, they're the only ones who have come up with something that clearly shows they saved lives with ventilator management. So what you're going to learn today is the ARDSNET strategy. So the first thing you always have to know is mode. Tons of modes on ventilators in the ED, unless you know better, just use assist control. So you come up to your ventilator, you just choose assist control. I, I'm not going to debate now these other modes of ventilation. I use other modes all the time. I probably am not establishing any benefit by doing so. 
just stick with assist control. And assist control essentially means that you're going to dial in a respiratory rate, a tidal volume, uh, and the patient's going to get at least that no matter what. If they take a spontaneous breath, the machine will give a machine breath at whatever tidal volume you set. So for instance, let's say you set the patient at 10 breaths per minute and 500 cc's per breath. All right, if the patient's unconscious, you gave them a ton of sedation, they're gonna get those 10 breaths and 500 cc's per breath. Now the patient's waking up and they're over-breathing the vent, they're taking a couple extra breaths. Each of those extra breaths, they'll initiate, but the ventilator will give all of the support, it'll give 500 cc's, the patient won't really be doing any work. That's assist control. It'll work just fine for any of your ED patients. All right, then you have a ton of other dials. What do they all do? What do they mean? Well, we can make it pretty easy here. We could just split it into four, and we're gonna discuss each one. First one to understand is tidal volume. That's what that VT means. That's how the vent guys talk about tidal volume. And years ago, they used to use very high tidal volumes, and that was injurious. That's where all the lung injury came from. So why do I recommend low tidal volumes? All right, what you have to understand is that injured lungs are baby lungs. And since this was first coined by an Italian, we'll say injured lungs are bambino lungs. And you got this patient here. Look at those dependent lung portions, all right? Those are gone. That's consolidation. Um, those lung areas are not getting any of the tidal volume you put in, which means that there's a lot less lung than a normal person would have to actually accept the tidal volume of each breath. Now, as the patients get worse, like this, you can see there's a tiny fraction of those lungs that are available for gas exchange. If you give those lungs the same amount of tidal volume that healthy lungs would get, the good alveoli are gonna expand and explode, and the bad alveoli will never see any of that tidal volume. So essentially, even though they're fully functioning adults, or maybe not so fully functioning at this point in their injury course, they really have the lungs of babies. They have tiny little lung areas that actually are available for gas exchange. So you wanna lower the amount of gas you're actually giving them. That's why you use low tidal volume. So how do you set your tidal volume? All right, it's really easy. You're gonna give about six to eight cc's per kg. What you do is you start at the eight and you can work your way down to six if you need to. And I'll tell you in just a sec how you know if you need to. What you gotta understand is that this per kg is not the patient's actual body weight. So if the patient looks like the Michelin man, they're five foot two, but 500 pounds, you don't give them tidal volumes based on the 500 pounds. It's based on ideal body weight. I'm gonna give you that computation in the handout that goes with this lecture, but usually I don't even bother. Just look at the patient. Based on their height, you say to yourself, what an estimate of what their kilogram weight should be. So if the guy's 5'7", you say, oh, that's a 70 kilo guy. If it's a five foot one woman, you say, oh, maybe a, a 50 kilos. And if you're off, it doesn't matter. It's fine. You're not going to be uh, really changing the amount of tidal volume you give so much. It's just a, the key is that if you see someone who's 600 pounds and 5'1", you don't give them the 600 pound tidal volume. You just say, oh, they're probably around 60 kilos. So you have now uh, your settings, eight cc's per kg based on some estimate of their ideal body weight. Now, the way you think about tidal volume is tidal volume equals protection. That's the only time you change tidal volume is when the patient needs more lung protection. And I'll tell you what that means in a sec. But what tidal volume doesn't mean is ventilation. And what I'm saying with that is if the CO2 is 60, you don't go up on your tidal volume. You don't go up on your tidal volume. If the CO2 is 20, you don't go down on your tidal volume. Tidal volume is not a way to adjust ventilation. The only time you change tidal volume is when the lungs haven't achieved enough protection. All right, this moves us down to the next dial, inspiratory flow rate. This is the one most often ignored, and that's okay because if you had to forget about one of them, this is it. 
but you can make the patient a little better off if you know what you're doing with this mode. It's also called peak flow. What inspiratory flow rate is, is how quickly the breath is going to be delivered. If you set the inspiratory flow rate high, then the breath goes in. If you set the inspiratory flow rate low, then the breath will go in as. But essentially, you're delivering the same tidal volume. It's how quickly it goes into the patient. Now, you might think that slower would be more comfortable, but it's actually not usually. See, what happens is you want air, but an assist control ventilatory mode is controlling how quickly the air comes in. And if you have an inspiratory flow rate that's set too low, the patient wants air, but the machine is not willing to give it. That makes patients very, very upset. And if you see patients sucking on the endotracheal tube, getting really upset, looking like they're struggling, usually it's because the inspiratory flow rate is set too low. Now, let's say you set it too high. Well, now it's going in a little quicker than the patient might want. Most people are okay with that. They're happier with that. So you always err on the side of going a little high on the inspiratory flow rate. Now, the problem with this in general is that's not how we breathe physiologically. Physiologically, the way we breathe is, you know what, I'll take a deep breath with me right now because that'll uh, also clear your head a little. And what you'll see is at the very beginning, you take in a ton of air and you just kind of taper out as your lungs start filling. Uh, some ventilators actually give the breath like that. It's called a decelerating ramp of uh, flow rate. And, and that's really more physiologic. Patients are a lot more comfortable with that. But if you had an air on the side of giving too much at the end or not enough at the beginning, you always choose the former, which means you set the inspiratory flow rate nice and high. So generally, I'll set this at 60 to 80 liters per minute. Now, think about what this means. If we set a tidal volume of around 500 and we have a 60 liter per minute inspiratory flow rate, it means one liter per second, which means that 500 cc breath took about half a second. So each of these breaths would go in about half a second. And that, that's a good starting point. But like I said, if you have a patient that looks uncomfortable, they look like they are not getting enough air at the beginning of each breath, then you just raise it up. And you really, you can't do too much wrong with this dial. You go wherever you need to go. And when we get to the obstructive path, we'll tell you why you might want to increase it for those patients. So we said tidal volume equals protection. And by that same trend, inspiratory flow rate equals comfort. That's when you're going to change this setting. If the patient doesn't look comfortable in the vent, you're going to increase the inspiratory flow rate. All right, third dial, respiratory rate. All right, to understand this, you just need a couple of numbers. Don't get scared. All right, you're sitting in your car, maybe you're sitting on the subway. Right now, you're breathing 60 cc's per kg per minute to maintain eucapnia. As soon as you get intubated, that requirement doubles because of the increased dead space from the circuit and your own intrinsic dead space to 120 cc's per kg per minute. All right, let's say you have a 70 kilo guy. That means he needs 8,400 cc's per minute to maintain eucapnia, to maintain that 40 PaCO2. And we, we are doing that nice lung protective strategy, so we put them on 500 cc's. That's somewhere between seven and eight cc's per kg. How many breaths does he need to maintain eucapnia? Well, the answer is 17. Now, I see very low respiratory rates as a starting point for most patients when I come in and look at the ventilator settings before my arrival. That's not good. These patients will be hypercapnic. Hypercapnia is a horrible physiologic stimuli. Patients hate it. It essentially makes them feel like they're drowning. So don't do it. You start your respiratory rate at 18, 16 to 18 if you really are uh, scared of these high ones. But 18 is where I start. I'd rather they be a little hypocapnic than hyper. And I'll see my blood gas and I'll adjust from there. Do not start these patients at 10, eight breaths a minute if you're using this lung protective strategy. They need the minimum 16 to 18 breaths per minute. So now we've established that VT, tidal volume equals protection. Only time we change that dial is for lung protection. We said inspiratory flow rate equals comfort. That's the one we'll change that dial. 
And now we know respiratory rate is how we change the ventilation of your patient. Well, this is great because we've separated out all these settings. We don't have to worry now if the CO2 is 75, what setting to change. There's only one setting to change, respiratory rate. We're splitting up the functions of the ventilator here. Hopefully this is making sense. Respiratory rate is how you change ventilation. If they're hyperventilating, you go down. If they're hypoventilating, you go up on your respiratory rate. That's it. Now, if any of you budding toxicologists could recognize this molecule, I'll be very impressed. It's actually an aspirin molecule. And the reason I put it up there is some patients will need very high minute ventilations. If you get an aspirin toxicity that God forbid you have to intubate, they're going to need at the minimum 240 cc's per kg per minute. And if you're doing this lung protective strategy, which works just fine on these patients as well, you'll need about 36 breaths per minute. And you start there and you go perhaps up from there. But these critically ill tox patients actually are at risk for acute lung injury as well. You could easily keep these patients at very high respiratory rates and maintain that low CO2 you need to compensate for their acidosis, even with this lung protective strategy. And if you want to know more about intubating these patients, then go to the podcast on intubating the severe metabolic acidosis patient. All right, we're now down to the last dial. And I stick two things on this dial because really they should be moving in tandem. I've actually seen a ventilator that has FiO2 and PEEP combined into one dial, which I don't necessarily agree with in real life, but the, the concept is good. All right, here's the way I play it. I start these patients at 100% FiO2 right after intubation. You make up for any hypoxia you cause during the intubation. I wait five minutes to let everything equilibrate. I get an ABG at this point. And you can make all sorts of arguments about the lack of necessity for ABGs in the ED. That's fine. If you want to do a VBG, then knock yourself out. Uh, I, I think there's still value to a 100% FiO2 ABG. I like it. I'm usually putting A-lines in my critically ill patients. It's not a big deal to get the gas, but if you have a problem with it, don't do it. And after that, I drop them right down to 40%. I don't titrate down, I don't screw around. You go right down to 40% instantly, five minutes into their ventilator course. Please, please don't leave these patients on 100 for hours before you titrate their vent. Go right down to 40. And while you're still at the bedside, see what happens. You'll see the results of that FiO2 drop within a couple minutes. You don't have to wait forever. Then once they're at 30 or 40%, you're going to titrate their FiO2 and PEEP in tandem using a PEEP scale. This was from Ardsnet. They found when people do it this way, people live more often than the random guess as to what FiO2 and PEEP they need. So here's the way it works. Let's say you have them on 40%. You put them on five of PEEP to start off with. I keep all my patients who are uh, not dramatically hemodynamically unstable on at least five of PEEP, just as a starting point. So I'm not running anyone at a PEEP of zero or a ZEEP. So they're at 40%, five of PEEP, and you look at their oxygen saturation. Now, in order to net, the goal was 88 to 95%, which means no lower than 88. I use 90, it's a nice even number. And no greater than 95%. You don't ever want these patients satting 100. Because when they're setting 100, you don't know if their PaO2 is 80 or 400, and you don't need it to be 400. So you want to have that 95% as your top line. They don't need more than that. It's not beneficial. So I need them to be greater than 90%. All right, let's say on that 40% FiO2 and 5 a peep, they're setting 86%. All you do is you move up on the peep scale one notch. So I would now move one over from the 0.4 and 5 to the 0.4 and 8. So I increase the PEEP to 8. And I'll give them 10 minutes or so. If they're satting greater than 90, I leave them there. If they're still satting less than 90, I go up again. And now I'm going to increase my FiO2 to 50%. And I'll just keep working up the scale until they're greater than 90. 
And yes, you can make it up to 24 peep in the ED. You're not going to need that very often at all. But if you did, it's, it's totally safe and it's very appropriate. By the same token, if the patient's setting 100%, I'm going to move down on the PEEP scale. So if I had made it up to 0.5 and 8 of PEEP and the patient had recruited and gotten better and now they're setting 100, I'll go down a notch. So I'm always going to keep them between 88 and 95%. You're like, oh my God, these high peeps towards the end of the scale, I'm gonna pop the lungs. It's not how it works. Peep does not pop lungs. That's a myth and I'll explain why. All right, this is another peep scale the ArtsNet folks looked at. And you can see that before these folks ever left 30% FiO2, they were already on a peep of 14 right off the bat and they made it up to 24 much more quickly these patients when studied against the standard peep scale i just showed you had no increased lung injury no increased pop lungs this was very safe the only thing is it didn't show any mortality benefit though there were uh, subgroups that looked better on this higher peep scale um, so, but they just said, well, let's not push things. We'll, we'll just stick with the standard since this one doesn't have mortality benefit. But this one was perfectly safe, um, even though it's much higher levels of PEEP much earlier on. So do not worry about the standard PEEP scale. So let's talk about PEEP. PEEP is good. It improves ventilation, perfusion, matching. It decreases shunt. It decreases atelectasis and atelectotrauma which is when the lungs cyclically open and close, the alveoli open and close, that's the worst thing you could do for sick alveoli, open and close them constantly. It improves spontaneous breathing. It's a lot easier to breathe with full lungs than empty ones. It's just like blowing up a balloon. So you're at a kid's birthday party, you have to blow up 50 balloons. When you first start blowing, it's really hard to get air into them. And then once there's some air in there, it becomes a lot easier. Same thing with PEEP. If the alveoli have some air in them, they're much easier to inflate for a sick patient than uh, if they're empty. Now there is bad. The bad is that venous return will be decreased and these patients will need additional fluid to get back to that nice cardiac output level they were before PEEP. That's okay. We could work with that. But the myths are that PEEP causes pneumothorax. PEEP does not cause pneumothorax and that the patient's head will explode. So now we said tidal volume equals lung protection. We said inspiratory flow rate equals patient comfort. We've established that respiratory rate equals ventilation. And now we have the last concept, which is a combination of FiO2 and PEEP equal oxygenation. If the oxygen is low, you fix it by increasing the FiO2 and PEEP in tandem by the PEEP scale, and if they're too high, greater than 95% oxygenation, then you decrease the FiO2 and PEEP in tandem using the PEEP scale. Now, why is this important? Well, what this scale forces you to do is if a patient is satting poorly, what's going on is that their alveoli have to be shunting. Because once you get beyond about 40% FiO2, the only real problem that could be causing the patient to be hypoxic is shunt. And if the alveoli are shunting, the solution to that is increasing the mean airway pressure. That is increasing the PEEP. What the scale forces you to do is get to the point where the alveoli are no longer being lost, where they're not being de-recruited. On this graph, you can see, you want the alveoli to be in an optimal place. You want them to be never fully shut, but not overexpanded. And if we deal with this bottom portion where the alveoli are de-recruiting, what this PEEP scale forces you to do is keep the PEEP above the point where the alveoli are de-recruiting. It just forces you to do it. You don't have to think about it. It happens naturally. Because when the patients are satting well, the alveoli are not de-recruiting de anymore. And we'll talk about how to make sure that the PEEP 
and pressures are below that top portion, that over distension portion in just a second. Right now, the peep scale forces you to get to the point where the alveoli are no longer being lost. All right, let's talk about that, that top portion. How do we avoid the pneumothorax? How do we avoid the patient's head from exploding? The answer is we'll check the plateau pressure. All right, this is a ventilator pressure waveform on a volume control mode like the one we're using. And what happens is the air rushes through the endotracheal tube, the tracheobronchial tree, and you'll see very high initial pressures. Those are called peak pressures. They're what make your ventilator alarm. They're totally irrelevant. They mean nothing to the patient's safety. They mean nothing to the patient's alveoli exploding. They're useless. All they're good for is making the vent alarm go off. They have no reflection of what the alveoli are seeing. Now you can see, after you get to that top portion of the waveform, it kind of levels off for a second before it drops back down. That's your plateau pressure. That's once the system is equilibrated with your alveoli, that's the pressure they're actually seeing. That's the number that matters. If that number is good, the alveoli are safe. And if it's not, they're at risk of barotrauma. Problem is, your ventilator doesn't give you that number without you doing some work. Because normally there is no plateau period. The ventilator delivers its oxygenation and then drops off to zero very quickly. And there's not time for you to see what that plateau pressure is. So what we said is peak pressure, peak pressure means nothing. Plateau pressure is everything. And where you want to keep the plateau is less than 30 centimeters of water. If you do that, the lungs are protected. If it's above that, uh, then the lungs are at risk. And that's the key. So this is just one ventilator. Um, essentially what you do is, is you got to find the inspiratory hold button on your ventilator. It's in the lower right corner in this one and it's in your handout, but you gotta find for your own ventilator. They all have it, they all have an inspiratory hold button, and you gotta find it. And what you do is the patient gets a breath, you hold down the inspiratory hold button, and somewhere on your ventilator screen, it will tell you what the plateau pressure is. It might also say alveolar pressure on some of the vents, but somewhere on it, it will tell you the plateau pressure. What you wanna do is just call respiratory, and for your ventilators, have them show you once how to do a plateau pressure. After that, you'll know, and you can do it yourself. And just every 20 minutes, half hour or so, you come to the vent and you do a plateau pressure check. If it's less than 30, you're golden. If it's greater than 30, what do you do? Well, if it's greater than 30, that means these lungs are at risk for over distension. The alveoli are getting put at risk of barotrauma. That's not good. So what do you do if the plateau pressure is greater than 30? Well, we said, if the plateau pressure is greater than 30, these lungs are not protected. They're at risk. And we said, what dial affects lung protection? We said tidal volume affects lung protection. If the plateau pressure is greater than 30, the answer is easy. You go down on your tidal volume. And if there were 8 cc's per kg at this point, you go to 7 cc's per kg. If they're at 7, you go to 6. If they're at 6, you go to 5. Until you get to the point where the plateau pressure is less than 30. All right, so we have all our dials we spin now. We said tidal volume, lung protection, plateau pressure is too high, we drop that down. Inspiratory flow rate, patient comfort. Patient looks like they're sucking, they're not getting enough air, you increase your inspiratory flow rate. Respiratory rate, ventilation. CO2 is too high, go up on your respiratory rate. CO2 is too low, go down. FiO2 and PEEP together are oxygenation. SAT is less than 90, you go up in tandem using the PEEP scale. SAT's greater than 95, you go down in tandem using the PEEP scale. All right, these patients will need good sedation. It's the only disadvantage to using assist control volume mode and this lung protective ventilation is they'll need some sedation. We've already discussed, we've already discussed what the optimal strategy for that is. Start with analgesia. That will blunt the patient's pain of having the endotracheal tube back there. It will blunt the effects of hypercapnia. Patients will be very happy with an optimized dose of fentanyl or morphine. At that point, 
you add on a sedation agent as a bonus, whether it be propofol, Ativan, Versed, what have you. Analgesia first, sedation as a bonus. All right, that's part one. Part one is the lung injury strategy, which works for every patient except for what we'll discuss in part two, which is the obstructive situation. All right, hopefully you enjoyed this talk. Please send me comments, let me know what's going on. And I actually feel another rant coming on, so that'll be up in the next couple weeks. I'll try to do part two uh, one week from now, so there won't be too much space between them. That's all for today. Scott Weingart for the MCRIT Podcast. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.